Paul, uh, welcome back to the Evolve Move Play podcast or whatever this will be on your channel. I imagine it's going to go up on both. So um, it's good to be in dialogue with you once again. Um, yeah, last time felt like there was a lot left on the table to discuss. And so um, uh, I'm excited to, to get into it. But before we get started, um, once again, a lot of interesting things have happened. You published a, uh, a whole video about, you know, stories and superheroes referencing Jordan Peterson on the day that Jordan Peterson was <laughs> revealed to be Red Skull. <laughs> <laughs> that hilarious. I look at Twitter that morning. It's like, oh, wow. Isn't that funny? That I don't believe in, in Young's concept of synchronicity, but then sometimes something like this happens and you're like, I don't know how to explain that. That's bizarre. I mean, I'm, I guess there's lots of people making videos about Jordan Peterson. So, but yeah, I don't know. Well, I had, I had just, how did I get into it? Um, I, a nerd writer. So nerd writer is a YouTube, a pretty major YouTube channel and it popped up and I, watched a video and then I saw the Marvel man thing and I had seen the justice league, Jack, mm -hmm. uh, Jack uh, Snyder. And, you know, I, I done all that. And so then I watched that nerd writer video. I thought, Oh, that's interesting. And then I had seen Watchmen. I'd watched the movie Watchmen before, but it was sort of like watching the theatrical cut of justice league it was sort of a mess. And so I didn't yeah. quite know what to make of it. So then I watched another YouTube video about Watchmen and it was like, Oh, uh, just a bunch of things were falling into place because I, I do think that there is, you know, Peterson and Sam Harris's comments about superheroes in the, in the, in the Zack Snyder edition of justice league. That's very clear. And in many ways, superheroes sort of function as gods movies and movie, th movie theaters as temples temples in the ancient world were places that you could go to have an experience of the transcendent and of the divine. Uh, years ago, there was a cable TV show, something about ancient wonders, and they were talking about the basically the technology they would use in ancient temples. For example, Artemis of the Ephesians, purportedly that idol was just she was just covered with breasts and the breasts would, you know, milk would flow from the breasts. And so people would make pilgrimages to that temple and see this giant statue with, you know, breasts giving milk abundantly. And of course the, the, the priests set all that up and it was ancient technology, but the, the same technologies are still at work today. If you go to the Capitol mall in Washington, DC, you know, enormous, you know, beautiful monuments to Lincoln, which is basically a copy of the Temple of Zeus, uh, Thomas Jefferson. I mean, an ancient person dropped into the Washington Mall would say, "This is yeah. this is this is the holy. This is the this is the um, Parthenon of America. Here it is. It's we don't stop these things." So, yeah, I think I think it is. A, I'm I'm super interested in that conversation. I love the Watchmen. Um, you know. I think the way that you break it down in that video that you did was, was quite interesting. And, you know, it gets into the, the, the problem of, of how we sort of recover narratives that work while also recognizing the way that they, that uh, simplistic versions of them can be very misleading. And I think that, you know, this is something you've been tooling with a lot and thinking about kind of the, the potential conversation between John Bravaki and Jordan Peterson is like, yeah. okay, when, when is heroism uh, a guide that, that informs and when is it a addiction that deceives? Yeah. What, when is heroism sort of a, a sanctified played up egoism? And, you know, as in the pastoral vocation, this is a, this is a constant battle. Now, you know, I, my today's video, I talked about platforms and, you know, on Twitter this morning, I quipped how, you know, someone in the religious news service just put out a piece that, you know, Beth Moore inspired all of these women to be preachers. And so I, in a very 
sarcastic way quipped founder of uber inspires um women to you know keep horses uh, because in many ways being a pastor of a local church is sort of like having a stable as compared to influencers on instagram or youtube or even just via publishing who are establishing these enormous platforms that are tremendously influential yet as a minister of a local church who is bringing the word of God to the people, there are tremendous temptations to messianism. And, and this captures pastors all the time. And so, in fact, I have an ongoing conversation with someone in the Bridges of Meaning Discord server. He thinks I should be more of a Messiah. And I keep, he's not a Christian. And I keep telling him, this is exactly what Christianity attempts to address with respect to Jesus, where you already have a Messiah, but he doesn't act like the script of what Messiahs are supposed to do to save the world. That script is well rehearsed by Alexander the Great, Apollo, Zeus, Caesar. Cyrus. Yeah, Cyrus. I mean, that, that is the script. And Jesus keeps breaking that script. And so Christian clergy are themselves supposed to follow Jesus in that script. I mean, Jesus tells his disciples, um, you have one master and you're all brothers. And that's, you know, that's a radical egalitarian message. But yet you've got hierarchies going all up and down through it. And so in terms of Christian vocation, those issues are, you know, those issues are very present and, and you can find them worked through. And for example, the American president is the servant of the people. You know, these public officials are public servants. I mean, it, it's Christianity is just shot through all of this stuff, but we don't see it because we're so used to seeing it in different forms. So that brings us to, you know, what is kind of, for me, the central theme that I wanted to to, to dig into deeply today, which is I wanted to question some of the assumptions that we made in our last conversation. And, um, uh, you know, I would say that in some sense, I'm, I'm reaching towards Christianity and, and I'm trying to understand it. The minimum of trying to more deeply understand how it has impacted what the West is and what's good about the West and how we retain that. Um, and so I would say that I'm I'm pretty sympathetic to some of the arguments that you make, or the arguments that uh, Jordan Peterson has made, that Tom Holland has made, Jonathan Peugeot has made. Um, but I think that it's really valuable to to um, to steel man the counter position, right? So I talked about the the layers of Christianity, right? We have an implicit layer of acting out the ethic. We have the the layer of implicitly being grounded in it. You know? So this is one of the ones that I have questions about. Right? So Peterson makes a case that that we live within essentially a Christian dream uh, in some sense. And that modernism, or as you call it, uh, arises out of that dream, but it, it's almost not stable on its own, right? It, it is more dependent on this underlying grammar than it realizes, and it kind of hasn't scaffolded up a complete replacement for it. And I would say that that's my impression also of what Tom Holland talks about in Dominion, but I haven't had a chance to read all of Dominion. So I know of his arguments more, um, more via you and other folks than, than directly. But, uh, but I, I have a sense that that's true. Um, but on the other hand, there is a counter narrative, right? Like Peterson sits down with Steven Pinker and he says, you know, you know, they talk about all the stuff that they agree on and then, uh, Peterson brings up the idea that the enlightenment, the, you know, the, these values that, that Pinker thinks we need to work so hard to retain right now are in some sense developmental from Christianity. And he asks Pinker what Pinker thinks about that. And Pinker basically says, I don't think so. Maybe I don't think that's important, right? <laughs> like his response is basically what preceded the enlightenment is, is, is not interesting. And, um, and, and he's not foundational to what the Enlightenment was. And so one, one narrative that you'll hear is that, um, in fact, the Enlightenment is, is Europe waking up from a oppressive Christian um, worldview that had 
prevented the creativity of civilization because of um, because of, of Christianity. Christianity wasn't wasn't the helping hand of the Enlightenment. It was rather the the villain that was holding the Enlightenment back until Europeans rediscovered um, Aristotelian science via Islam, right? And then finally, we're able to slay the dark superstitions of the Dark Ages in the medieval Europe, right? So I, I'm curious to, I, I, I'd, I'd like to start by asking you to steel man that argument, right? If you were to make the argument that, that in fact, the Enlightenment is really primarily something that is uh, a reaction against Christianity, what would that look like? Well, if you if you look at Rousseau, Voltaire, you know many of the Locke, you know they're they're interesting critters. Of course, um, Rousseau is from Geneva, <laughs> of all places. Um, there is in Voltaire a strong pushback against, and Rousseau, you know, strong pushbacks against institutional tyranny and magical thinking. Well, there is with Voltaire. Rousseau, on the other hand, sort of, you know, with romanticism, mm -hmm. gives himself completely over to magical thinking, let's say. So I, I can very much, I can understand, I can understand Pinker's argument I, I have difficulty steel manning it because I just find it historically non-curious. Mm -hmm. Knowing, you know, it, it's almost as if, well, if if the Romans, if if Christianity hadn't disturbed the progression of the Roman Empire we would have had the enlightenment sooner. This is like Gibbon's argument, right? The rise and fall of love. Of, yeah, yeah, in of, some ways. The problem, like, the problem is that I don't know if anyone who reads what was happening in late antiquity would ever make such an argument because Constantine, who gets maligned, both by Christians and by those who imagine that Christianity was a disturbing interruption of Roman progress, Constantine comes to power at a time when you just have this, this perpetual succession of would-be dynasties that can't hold their own. And if you read someone like Peter Brown, he and, and Tom Holland goes into this, Basically, the load of polytheistic paganism, the costs were just simply too great. And Augustine in late antiquity mocks the pagans for this because you have a God for the door and a God for the doorknob and a God for the hinge. And basically what the, in terms of their worldview, the only way to sort of stay on top of the world and to manage the gods was to look for a God that could be God of gods. Mm -hmm. that, that was essentially the technological barricade that they were up against, that no one was wealthy enough to continue to pay off all the gods in order to maintain the universe. And so there was a thrashing about looking for one God who could rule them all. And Constantine, you know, that, and there's, and so a bunch of different would-be Roman Empire emperors try out these gods. Tom Holland talks about this in some other videos you can find on the internet. They try out these gods. And basically, Constantine tries the Christian god. Mm -hmm. And Constantine establishes a fairly stable dynasty, and it works. And so the pagan world kind of has to look at that and say, you know, Christianity seems to work better than the alternatives and well that that's the story then goes from there because what you begin to get then in christianity what what constantine has to live with so constantine keeps trying to sort out the all of the intramural conflicts within christianity 
that become the 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 subject of all the Christian of all the of all the you know basically all the big Christian meetings. How do we understand Jesus? How do we understand God? Are we Unitarians or are we Trinitarians? Constantine wants this all sorted out because unless the religion can really get in line with you know the way things are then the emperor really can't continue to you know climb up the ranks of power and divinity and control and rule the world i mean that's the process that's the that's that's the project of the ancient world that's the religious project and so if someone like pinker comes along and says well christianity was this huge intrusion he, he simply doesn't understand the classical world at all because that was the project the i mean pontus was the title of the roman empire he was the bridge between humanity and the gods as was pharaoh as was that that was the way the ancient world worked and yeah. so the problem i have with with pinker is i just don't see a coherent argument that actually engages the historical facts of late antiquity and Christianity comes along and actually resolves these conflicts, which is why Christianity wins. But that then sets up new issues because the, the difficulty with every success is its success. And so what, you know, what then has to be dealt with. So then you have the Protestant reformation Really, my take on this is that the printing press. Before we get to the Protestant Reformation, let's do what's that? Counter. I said before we get to the Protestant Reformation, if we could just back up a second, because there's a few important points there. I um. So I think I think very few historians take Gibbon's view at this point that right. that Christianity is is itself causal of the fall of the Roman Empire, right? I, I'm, you know. I uh, dove deep into um, uh, Patrick Wyman's Fall of Rome series, uh, which is a podcast series, but it's very good. And, you know, essentially he lays out a lot of uh, climatic changes that were happening. You had the plague of Justinian. Um, you had all of these things that were hitting. And, um, and there, so there's a couple of counterfactual or a couple of points that are, that come up there, which is one is, uh, well, Rome didn't actually fall. Uh, that's an important point to understand is that Rome continues for another thousand years in the East as a Christian uh, civilization um, and continues to be essentially the guiding light of what arises in the West. Like the Franks, which become the dominant culture, right? They ape Rome very, very deeply and the Goths as well and Italy and Spain. And, um, but they're, they're, they're not, there's reasons why it collapses um, but there's also reasons why the states that come after become Christian states. You know, you can make that argument. But I wanted to push back a little bit on the argument that I'm, I'm curious to know more about the argument that, that, that traditional paganism sort of has a cost that Christianity doesn't. Because it, it seems to me that in China, you have a civilization that retains these sort of propitiatory small gods um, right up until the modern period, if I understand it correctly, and Japan as well. And I mean, both of these are imperial projects that become quite insane, but I mean, China is, you know, the other great empire of history in some sense. Uh, and they never really adopt, I mean, this is, you know, one of the great mysteries of world history. They never really adopt a single great, you know, prophetic non-killing religion. There's no, there's no central Zarathustrianism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam that ever becomes the dominant thing within within China and China always has ancestor worship always has household god worship right to the present you know right until essentially the Maoist revolution as far as I understand so what do you make of that as a counter argument to the idea that it is the costs of paganism that sort of um, result in the widespread adoption of Christianity I, I really don't know Eastern history well enough to understand or to to, to lay out a narrative about that what what seems clear is that the costs of pagan polytheism in the west as they developed 
basically reached a limit. Mm -hmm. Now, what other factors there were in the East that, um, that were able to stabilize the, that were able to stabilize the capacity for um, empires to maintain some, some type of cult that made sense in terms of their overarching stories. I don't know. Perhaps there were, perhaps they found ways in the East to do it that, that they didn't have in the West. But yeah, to come back to Pinker's issue, yeah. the, scientific, the scientific revolution happens in the West, not in the East. And it happens in such a way that the West conquers the East. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so Tom Holland had a very interesting, Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook had an interesting episode podcast of The Rest is History. They brought in a China expert. And, you know, the China, part of the question of the China expert was why didn't, I mean, China was, China was technologically well ahead of the West for, you know, most of pre-modern history. Yeah. Why didn't China conquer and colonize? And the answer that particular scholar gave was they didn't see the point. And so then you have the question, why did the West see the point and not the East? And that's probably also going to go back to being a religious question. I can't answer it, but that's what I know in terms of the comparisons of the two approaches to civilization. Yeah, I mean, here's a, a narrative and uh, for everyone listening, I highly recommend taking the giant grain of salt, but Confucianism is the, is the central pillar of, of, of Chinese civilization. And in some ways, the civilizations that all uh, relied on the same common cultural grammar. And it's really a, a religion of the state. It's a religion of how to stabilize the state. And China didn't have to conquer the world because they were at the center of world trade. I mean, I mean what did they care about those bizarre looking barbarians in the far side of it? As long as those barbarians were happily buying up all their silk and spices and they were making lots of money, there wasn't a point. Um, but also they never scaled the productivity, right? Like uh, something happens in Northern Europe where you know, I think, you know, some analysis say going back to the 12th century, where you're seeing, um, you're seeing uh, a, a scaling up of things in a way that's not happening in the East. So they're, they're ahead in many ways for a long time, but you don't see the, the takeoff kind of point to the same degree. I mean, that there's, there's a lot of deep historical analysis that go back and forth on that. So I'm certainly not an expert. Um, it's an interesting thing to look at, but uh, but the counterpoint is that in some sense, Christianity, you could say that Christianity is about seeking the truth, right? That it, that it has the central ethic of, of the truth, um, the logos. And this comes through alchemy and you know, Peterson's ideas. And, and part of that is exploring. You don't find the truth without exploring. And so there's an ethic of exploration, perhaps, within the Christian cultural grammar. It, another interesting book to read in this is Charles Mann's 1493, where he talks Amazing. about, yeah. what's that? Amazing book. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and for the first time, the Americans are sort of, the Americas are sort of plugged into the world network and you get this, I mean, China has this need for silver. And yeah. I mean, you, you begin to get all of these, all of these little pieces coming together at the, the beginning of globalism. It's, you know, your point about Christianity and the truth is, is an interesting one because one might ask, what is Christianity really trying to get at? Now, certainly truth is in there. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The prologue of the Gospel of John begins with the Logos, um, but It's, it's remarkably difficult, and, and this is where, so, so the West finds a way to, if we look at modernity, modernity sort of takes on world improvement one crisis at a time, okay? And, and that's, 
if if you if you are strong in technology and strong in sort of a scientific approach to interacting with the world that's a very reasonable way to proceed okay we've got a climate change crisis let's see what we can do to fix that okay we've got an economic crisis we've got a covid crisis let's see what we can do to fix that i mean to to a certain degree the Western scientific technological approach approaches life in a sort of whack-a-mole way. If there's a problem, we can fix it. It's it's if we're looking at through the lens of let's say well-being, uh, less COVID is better than more COVID. We can know this, so let's get a vaccine. Um, carbon is a problem, so let's do windmills and electric cars and maybe nuclear reactors, but we're not sure about that. And you know, on and on and on and on and on. That's a very Western approach to life. Eastern approaches to life didn't tend to be that way as much. They tended to have, my impression is, a much broader holistic question of life. And so then if you look at Christianity, Christianity, these are, you know, these these questions are so difficult because even with the you know, the kinds of conversation we're having in, let's say, the Vervakian corner of things. Figuring out what the good life is, that's a remarkably difficult thing. And in some way, and and I think this is a weakness of Peterson's approach, we can have a good life with the meaningful pursuit of, of whack-a-mole fixes for human crises. And so, and I find this with certain personality types in church, their entire life is spent in the meaningful pursuit of solving one problem after another. And if you can do that for 80 years. Yeah, so. But that's not a good life. Okay, so I wanna jump on that for a second because I think there's a, a, an interesting sort of way to play with the archetypal imagery that, that, that Peterson offers here. Right? So you could say that dragons pop up into your sphere of, of salience, right? And, and one way to deal with that is to, is to slay the dragons that, that occur to you, right? And then the other way to do that is to try to figure out where the den of the dragons is, right? So you, you, you kill Grendel, but then you go to Grendel's to Grendel's mother, right? And so if we have a, again, like I, I hesitate to even speak to this because I really don't feel like I have enough understanding of it, but it seems to me that Confucianism is fundamentally about the idea that it, it's a really deeply deontological system. It's about duty right and, and the idea is that you can have a state that is operating in optimal harmony when each person operates in the correct duty to everybody else and the idea here is that the, the chaotic and negative potentials of being won't manifest necessarily in such a state so that's that's the emphasis of that and and, you, and there's you know the, the this interesting thing about eastern philosophy is there's always this relationship in, in China between Confucianism and Taoism, which is sort of this very different thing, right? Confucianism is all about social relationships. And Taoism is all about cultivating the self in some way to allow you to maybe access the flow state better and to let go of, of making effort that you don't need to make. Um, and then Buddhism comes in and offers its whole, its whole thing, which, you know, that's even further outside of my ability to speak intelligently about. Um, but those, those two things are always sort of in tension or always in, they seem to operate, uh, they seem to be maybe insufficient solutions individually. And then they, 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 they work well together, I guess. I think I'm gonna hand it back to you and the mic back to you for a second because I'm, I'm struggling to, to, to connect it back to what I need to well, say. Well, it's, it's interesting that so if we, again, go back to the Pinker question, why in 
Western Europe under the hegemony and in some, to some degree, the tyranny of the Roman Catholic system, why do such astounding things develop that in short order, they come to really control the rest of the globe? I mean, that's, that's the, you know, the Jared Diamond's Guns, Germans, Germs and Steel asks that question in some ways. Yeah. And of course, Peterson, I don't know enough Nietzsche to evaluate Peterson's assertion, assertion here. Peterson's assertion is that Nietzsche says what Roman Catholicism did was discipline Western Europe sufficiently. And I'm going to riff on Peterson because it's almost a proto scientific method that Roman Catholicism instills on Western Europe to eliminate multiple variables and say, this is one truth. We all live within. It's fairly tyrannically enforced. But why did that context produce the enlightenment? Now, I think at, at this point now, let's say a hundred years after the peak of modernity, we're already having questions whether it's the enlightenment or the endarkenment um, when it comes to certain aspects of the conversation. And I think, you know, to give Pinker his due, the enlightenment and the scientific revolution, which had been copied, you know, again and again in the East, you know, to, to, to think about what China is doing now with respect to, you know, through Marx, and Confucius and however it's the great Chinese communist experiment and the evolution of that that's taking place now, who knows? But obviously something was unlocked and unleashed in, now again, so the Protestant Reformation was all about returning to texts and the Protestant Reformation was in many ways a failure it, what it did was it unraveled Europe into yeah. bloody wars. And I think in many ways, if you look at Voltaire, the, in the light of the Protestant Reformation, what died was the idea that, that the great Protestant dream in some ways, that if we just read the text as it is or get back to a pure text, then we will have all the answers for pleasing God, let's say. And it failed, it led to bloodshed and war. And so what happens in the enlightenment is they say, we can't rely on texts to do this. We need other sources of certainty. And so then you have the twin in some ways, and this is to give Pinker his due, in some ways via, let's say, Renaissance humanism, which was also the daughter of the enlightened, was also mother of, of the Protestant Reformation. Now we're going to go back, go back to empiricism and rationalism. It is Renaissance humanism is the mother of the, of the Reformation. The Reformation is the mother of the Reformation. And in some yeah. ways, it's also the mother of the Enlightenment. But yeah. it's a re, you know, Renaissance humanism is a reappropriation of the classical period. I think that's the strongest case that Pinker mm -hmm. can make if we're gonna try and steel man him. But you can't, you don't see Renaissance humanism without a lot of what Tom Holland points to in Christianity of this perpetual reformation. We need to keep going back to the sources. And you see this in the Hebrew prophets, you see this in Jesus. And so this continual return to the sources is part of what draws Renaissance humanism we need better Greek texts of the Bible. We need to learn Hebrew. Um, it's also the continuation of Rome, but it's a Christian Rome. It's yeah. it's not the same, you know. It's not it's not the same Rome that was. So, 
So let, let's say I'm trying to go through some of the arguments that, that we made, right? Which is one of them is, you know, there's this, there's this Christian cultural grammar, which gives rise to a lot of the things that we want to preserve, right? Um, so, so one, one, one response to that is, well, it's just, it's just the classical period, right? That the Christianity essentially functions as an interlude between the rise of scientific thinking that starts in Greece and Rome, doesn't complete itself, is sort of swept under by the dark tide of Christianity, and then somehow springs up again in the Renaissance. So part of that argument would be that in fact Christianity actually damages the Roman Empire, and I think that I, th I think that's very weak. Like, and I think that um, it's it's very hard to support. So asking the steel man that was a difficult position to put you in. But I think we've we've di we've we've moved past that. But the next path, step of that is, well, can't you still see the Christian Christianity as essentially suppressing the potential for this realization of of, you know, essentially the birth of philosophy and, and the, the, the origins of, of the potential of science in the classical period. And it is not until Europeans get access to these texts that we start to see this again. And then what they're doing really, does it have anything to do with Christianity or isn't Christianity holding back Copernicus and Galileo and da Vinci and, and Newton, right? Um, you know, trying to suppress their, their understandings, which are so, uh, potentially disruptive to the power and the narrative of the church. So that's that's the next big case to try to grapple with, I would say. Part, always with these arguments, you have the question of of what exactly is Christianity in the in the story we're telling? Is it the um, the tyrannical the, the the church itself didn't execute people? The church worked in collaboration with magisterial authorities to execute people. The I mean, that's power to execute people directly. No, the church didn't have that power. The governments executed people because, again, what you see is this division. You know, all the way back to Constantine, the the state has the sword. This goes all the way back to the Apostle Paul. The state has the sword, not the church. But now when the church and the state are working together, well, the church says to the state, you got to kill this guy. Okay. And, you know, I've been just been doing some reading in the, you know, the English Reformation. And you find this swing saw, this swinging back and forth of, you know, now the state is killing these people. Now the state is killing these people, always in service of the church. Um, and it's all this church state stuff and who has legitimacy and supremacy. So, Asking, asking how the church, how how the church deals with these issues. There was a book I was reading not too long ago, basically making the argument that you know of all of the technological advances through the Middle Ages, which tend not to be um, tend not to be looked at in this, because you don't, you know, you don't see late antiquity Roman soldiers, and then you don't jump a thousand years and see zero development. In anything, <laughs> things do, and and your your other point that you made before is, in some ways, you know, I'm raising the question. Well, what are we talking about when we're saying Christianity? Earlier, you raised the point. What are we talking about when we say Rome? I mean, all the way, you cannot understand the right the Protestant Reformation without the particular and Byzant, dare we say, Byzantine politics of the <laughs> Holy Roman Empire. Um, Holy Empire, and I mean, people like. I think this is a perpetual call, right? We need to understand history better. Yeah. But like, I mean, I don't think most people understand who the Ottoman Turks were and the power that they had for such a long period, right in Europe, like on the gates of Vienna, right? And, and how that impacted it, you know, what Byzantium was, right? Or, you know, which is Rome, they didn't call themselves Byzantium. Like no, you know, what we call the Byzantine empire just called itself the Roman empire. But um, it, but, it, 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 but, yes, there's a historical. Get, yeah, but to get back to this question, so part of, so if you, so I did, I got my undergraduate degree in history. One of the things you very quickly learn about history is that history is storytelling, and in every decade, in every era, 
the storytelling we do comes from this era. Mm -hmm. And even a question such as, does the earth revolve around the sun? That, that is, that is just a, you know, so I would go, I had a, I had a friend who, who taught, who teaches sociology at a local university and he was teaching this class in this other school and he, he'd always bring me in to do a lecture on Christianity. And I'd usually begin by asking, how many of you believe the world is round? And everybody said, yes. How many of you can quickly demonstrate that to me? And they said, well, I've seen a picture. No, 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 no. I, I need something a lot more direct and no one could do it. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, well, let's imagine that you're on a coast and ships have masts and you look out in the distance and you see this little stick and the closer that gets, you know, the, the, the ship seems to come up out of the water, doesn't it? Um, and well, you know, there's a little simple, you know, idea about the curvature of the earth. And of course the Greeks had figured a lot of that out and so on and so forth. But it, it goes to demonstrate that many of the, what, what passes in a culture are a whole bunch of givens. And oh, one yeah. of our, we have a lot of givens in our culture that are inheritances of a lot of different fights. And even, even the question of the roundness or flatness of the earth a lot of that question can be answered. It depends on where you're standing because sort of what we have been trained to do when we think about the solar system is what we see in our head are a bunch of pictures of globes around. Yeah. So here's the sun and here's, you know, we, we, do, we do all of these things and these things have been built into us and trained into us. And anybody who isn't sufficiently indoctrinated into this way of thinking is a fool and a heretic. And as long as they're, you know, not, you know, there isn't a mob of flat earthers who are outside of, you know, some school district in Kentucky demanding that flat earthism be taught in some Kentucky school, school district, we leave them alone because they're not a threat. But this is sort of the way history works. And A lot of the, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the drama around Christianity tends to form around the stories that we think will bring us success. And, you know, you can have flat earthers, you can have young earth creationists, but once they want to get their hands on school books, and this tends to be the drama that we tell. So Christianity retarded science. Yeah, but it also, what is Christianity in that? Is it the, the tyranny of the church? Well, the tyranny of the church was killing all sorts of people for all sorts of ideas, depending on their relationship with a specific local government. But as a big story, it's a nice story that plays well in well, people shouldn't bother going to church or talking to preachers. Oh, okay. If that's your goal, tell that story. Um, it's, it's just, these are, these are hard things to sort of, to sort of manifest, especially yeah. in a day when not a lot of people go to church anyway. Yeah. I think there's, you know, there's an obvious case that the Christianity also shepherded the development of science. Gregor Mendel, Right, the founder of genetics uh, was, for instance, a uh, a monk, and in fact, we know that that um, that lots of scientific development happened in monasteries, and lots of the training in logic, and lots of the training in in the propagation of these same, um, you know, who who was copying down Aristotle's texts right. mostly. Well, and I would push that a lot further into the Enlightenment period, and this is where we get into my God number one and God number two. What was Newton trying to do? He was exploring God. Yes. Yeah. Newton's quite that, interesting. Yeah, but he was exploring God. These people were trying, they were trying to do, in a sense, it was called natural theology. Yeah. 
because God, you know, if you could figure out, if you could derive an equation for acceleration and velocity, all this Newtonian mechanics, you would know God better. That's what he was doing. Now, Steven Pinker says, you're not knowing God, you're knowing, oh, but now the definition of God has changed between Newton and us. And I think that's, so in that first conversation between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, at the end of the conversation, that was exactly the conflict. Because mm -hmm. Sam Harris looks back and says, Newton wasn't trying to get to know God, he was trying to get to know the world. Well, but the relationship between God and the world for Newton was very different than it looks to Sam Harris. Because for Sam Harris, God is a being out there, sort of yeah. like Zeus within a metadivine realm. But mm -hmm. that's not what the Hebrews conceived of. And that's not what was pulled through theology and philosophy through the Middle Ages into the early modern period. And in many ways, the fight in the Protestant Reformation about the Eucharist was all about this. And so to, to look at Newton and say Newtonian mechanics isn't theology, well, that's an adaptation that we have brought to Newtonian mechanics. It's not from Newton. Mm -hmm. So this is a point that I really struggle with. I, I mean, I think I'm reading a book right now called uh, The Spell of the Sensuous, which is by David Abram. And it is a exploration of, of phenomenology, you know, looking a lot at Husserl and Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, and then essentially um, comparing them with sort of indigenous forms, of indigenous, let's say, world orientation systems. I don't know how I have a better term for it right now, right? Um, and I find it interesting to, to, play, to read that and then also say, listen to Jonathan Pajot and because fundamentally he's, he's in some sense, they're running the same, uh, they're, they're using a, uh, a system uh, within phenomenology and then they're running a traditional wisdom tradition through it and finding some kind of insight and maybe some system of validation or system of justification as Greg Henrique as I call it, that that is personally satisfying and seems to answer questions that they need. But the insights generated seem to be at least at the surface, not necessarily congruent, right? Like is the, is the do we need to go back to the story of, of the indigenous or do we need to go back to the story of Christianity or do we need some point at which those things actually start to cohere into something above, right? Like maybe there's a Ken Wilber, uh, you know, transcend and include thing where, where the, the, the Christianity or the religion of the future captures all the value that Christianity has brought and yet somehow goes back into shamanism and somehow brings in Buddhism and all those things and, and gets us to a point where we're getting how those actually cohere into one central thing. But, um, but there's definitely conflict on the way there, even if that is the end point, if, if it is the end point, which I'm not saying that I know for sure. Um, I wanna go down that road. I wanna dig into the phenomenology thing because it's a, it's, a, it's a problem. Well, but I almost the, feel- isn't, like isn't phenomenology, you know, in many ways, I mean, the reason we're at phenomenology is because we closed one eye and we derived huge knowledge by establishing a monarchical vision by which personal agency was, you know, when you're when you're a kid, you could there were there were like these pictures in magazines that had certain colors and they looked weird, but then you'd put like a red filter to your eye and you could see things. I mean, that's sort of what we do when we take out personal agency from the system is we say, okay, here's, here's a world without personal agency. And we run that so much, we hit a meaning crisis because now we're not even persons and we're not even personal agents, but we can't live that way. So we have to open the other eye. And in some ways, phenomenology is 
All right. Well, let's let's try and reintegrate being self. Let's reintegrate all of this into the system. Now, the most non-read C.S. Lewis book, probably besides the book he he put most of his effort into, which was English literature of the 16th century, very interesting <laughs> century for C.S. Lewis to do his masterpiece in, was The Discarded Image. And what's lovely about, it's just a tiny little book by C.S. Lewis, what's lovely about it is he, he basically in that book demonstrates how pagan, pagan mythology and thought and in terms of the image of the world, our image of the world, then continues and is integrated into medieval thought about our image of the world. And in the enlightenment, it is basically discarded because it doesn't work in some ways. It doesn't work in this way. And so it's discarded. But, you know, when you ask questions about paganism, well. One second. Yeah. Um, so a number of people are going to be listening to this on a podcast. So every time you say this way, Paul is putting a hand over one eye and looking up only on the other eye. So I just wanted to, to note that for all the people who are not seeing the visual for us. Thank <laughs> Go you. ahead, continue, Paul. So, so th that's why I, I wonder if in a few hundred years, the Enlightenment won't be called the Endarkenment because we basically closed one eye to the Less world. Like I mean, and and that that rhymes with Woden. Left, right? <laughs> you know, you, you want knowledge, Odin? It's going to cost you an eye. That's kind of what the Enlightenment does. But then you get to a point and you realize we kind of need that other eye back, and we don't know how to keep what we've gained. Odin is such an interesting mythological figure. I feel like people don't study that enough, but. Um, We've tore out our eye in order to see the world in such a way that we can create nuclear weapons. Um, but we've lost the, the eye that tells us not to use them. We've lost I, I agree with that completely. Now I'm just trying to problematize it, right? I'm trying. So, I mean, one of the arguments here, you know, so there's a couple, you know, there's, so the, the, the pinker argument or the secular humanist argument against Christianity is that Christianity essentially prevents the rise of secular humanism and, and, uh, and, and, and the enlightenment, right? And enlightenment values, you could say that enlightenment values are viewed as, um, as antithetical to Christianity. And then therefore what needs to be preserved is is Christianity or is is the Enlightenment? Right. What's good about the West is the Enlightenment, and you know this is this is. I feel like this is the battle that we fought, uh, or that I was fighting when I was 21 years old, right? And I'm on uh, Lord of the Rings forums, and in the general discussion era, we're just arguing between Christianity and atheism, right? And so that's one critique. But the other critique that you might have is. Well, Christianity gave rise to the Enlightenment, and that might be the bloodiest and most horrible of all possible, uh, you know, because there, you know, this phenomenological, let's say, um, David Abram type, Daniel Quinn, all these people who are saying, actually, this modern world that we've given rise to is actually potentially going to kill us all, and that it is certainly... Um, you know, it's, I've seen a few critiques of enlightenment now. And one of the things they talk about is Pinker really doesn't talk a lot about, well, some of the pe people he calls the enlightenment are people who are counter enlightenment. You know, that, that's what they were taught. That's what their perspective was. And there's not a lot of talk about the cult of rationality and the rivers of blood that were, that were put out by that. And, and I still think that the idea of certainty Right, this Cartesian certainty and the idea of the world as a clockwork that we can understand gives rise to the potential for this utilitarian thinking that you're talking about with Ozymandias at the end of Watchmen, right? It's like, if you, if you think the world is causally 
transparent. If you think that it is possible for an individual human or a group of human beings to understand the causal nature of the world completely, and if you believe that there is a higher good that you can be aimed at, then you can excuse any atrocity. And this is why I love Tolkien so much, because I think that that scene in the Mines of Moria where Gandalf says to Frodo, Right? It was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. Many are those that deserve death. Can you give it to them all? Many are those who deserve life. Can you preserve it for them all? Right? So I may have flubbed the quote slightly, but that's the basic thesis of it. And once you understand dynamical systems and ecological stuff and all this stuff that's bringing the Verveke perspective, the, the four ecog science that's saying this reductionist science that existed before, it doesn't really work, right? And, you know, and, where does that come from? Like Merleau-Ponty is a huge inspiration for what becomes for ecog stuff. Well, you're just not that smart. You just don't get to, you know, you don't get to, th there's no point at which a human being, any, any point at which you decide to be Ozymandias, it's hubris. It's never fully rational. Um, and, and you could say that we use the atom bomb and we use the atom bomb because we were inheritors of Descartes. <laughs> so I don't know that I have a question here other than I wanted to point out this, these, these two things, right? Because, we, because in some sense, there's the modernist critique of Christianity and then there's the postmodernist critique of modernism and Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I think John's was, project you know the the meaning crisis i thought was was such an apt framing of part of the crisis i think i think peterson probably would have pointed to dostoevsky you know notes from the underground yeah <laughs> uh, pointed to tolstoy you know tolstoy's story here's a man who in what 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 success doesn't he you know what success doesn't he enjoy Elon Musk, Howard Hughes, um, the we're not having a we're not having a meaning crisis because we're unsuccessful. Again, I, I've used this example before. I, you know, for the first seven years of my ministry, I worked among Haitians who were illegal immigrants in the Dominican Republic. These people had plenty of meaning in their life. Their life was filled with meaning because they were trying to scratch out an existence every day. Life was hard. It was unfair. They all knew it and understood it, but they were energized by meaning. And in many of their lives, they had two options. After, you know, 12 hours of backbreaking work, working for cash if they could get it, otherwise working in their garden just to put food on the table and keep body and soul together for their two, four, six, eight, 10, 15, 20 kids that were in their little hut. I mean, that was their life. And at night when the sun went down, they could either go to church or they could go to the, they could go drink gin and dance at, and there are a lot of little villages that there were two institutions. There was a church and there was drinking. Those were the options. It was simple. Um, If we say, and you know, this is at the end of Marxism and all sorts of things, if we say, well, the keeping, the care and keeping of a human being is just sort of the scaled up version of the care and keeping of a an alligator. You know, we know we even don't know what human beings should eat. We even don't know what they should do. I mean, that, that much is abundantly clear. Um, but you know. He, here's how, you know, life expectancy is this, give them amusements, give them entertainment, give them nutrients. Um, and no. I want to jump back just a second because there's some, there's something that's tipped off there that I think is interesting. In these little Haitian towns, there's the, the gin joint and the church. Yep. And so when you've worked all day, and you're beat down and you need human social uh, you know, support. Yep. Do you go There's to a no place? electricity. 
that that feeds your hedonic pleasures or to go feed, to a place feed your soul let's say and that could go either way so what came up for me is actually reading an ethnography of Scottish Highlanders, crafters, crofters on the, in the Hebrides. And what they talked about there was, is the same situation, right? Everybody drinks unless they're in church. And if you don't drink, you don't mix well and you'll be socially ostracized. So essentially you you either stay in the drinking sphere or what happens for a lot of people. Most people leave the church, become drinkers, rejoin the church in order to stabilize their lives and have families. And this yep. is the, this yep. is the pathway that plays out for them. Right? Yep. And so it's like, this ties to the theme they were talking about before that without a higher transcendent value, what we collapse to is pleasure. Right. Yes. And Baker, the, the inquiry, the, the, the villains of the piece who represent modernity, right? They say we are a race of lovers, right? Their central thing is pleasure, right? And, and all of its perversions. Okay, so, so you have these crofters and they have this choice between the church, which actually teaches pro-social behavior, gets them out of the alcohol abuse that makes them more likely to hit their spouses, more likely to not feed their children, more likely to burn through all their money so they can't feed their kids. Yep. Right. Angela's ashes. Yep. Right. Yep. If anyone's read that book, like you want to know what a lot of human history was like and how brutal and horrible it was and how powerful these institutions could be. Okay. Read that book. But here's the thing. Going to church was hard on these people too. There was an immense amount of social shame and immense constriction of behavior. Yep. When a lot of people look back at the history of Christianity, they say, man, I don't want to go back to that. Yep. I don't want to go back to, to being ashamed to look at what's in my pants. Yep. Yep. Right. And so there's damage, there's trauma in, in these, there's a, let's say there's a solution to a problem. Maybe, maybe Christianity you could say was the best solution that, that these people had available. Yep. to stabilize yep. their lives and get out of the, the descent that was offered by alcohol. Yep. And maybe when they weren't educated and they didn't have, and they were working 12 hours a day, you know, it's the only kind of solution they had, but is it really a solution now? Do we need to deal with that level of, of shame and, you know, um, social restriction, right? Good so. question. <laughs> well, and, and you know, but I could, I could, I could say, okay, well, let's let's look at Rafe Kelly. I mean, I've watched some of Rafe Kelly's videos. Rafe Rafe Kelly can do some really cool things. Rafe Kelly hangs on trees. He does parkour. He scampers on things. Um, Rafe, how restrictive are you of your diet? <laughs> um, so currently, I no uh, grains, no seeds, no sugar. Uh, I've had alcohol three times since the new year. Um, one less than a full glass of alcohol. Um, no, uh, yeah. Nuts, seeds, grains. Yeah. None of that. No processed foods. A bit tyrannical, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> it is considered in our culture, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But you do so. Nobody's putting a gun to your head or, you know, you know, keeping you from McDonald's, um, you're seeking a goal. And, and what we tend to look at is, um, what we tend to look at is our prohibitions by institutions for tyranny's sake. And yeah, there's plenty of that. But in many ways, what happens in Protestantism was an attempt to reunify the church and the monastery. That's a big part of Protestantism. And, um, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends. But, and do people get it wrong? Yeah, terribly wrong. But, um, you know, petty human tyrannies are in nearly every household. And, you know, I, almost any marriage is a potential tyranny of one way or another. Yeah, or both ways. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I think a lot, 
a lot rides on the question of what kind of human what kind of human life is this world capable of supporting and what are its costs mm-hmm. and in and and so so then i look at say john verveke's project if you look at dante let's say dante imagines well what is the good well it's this beatific vision Okay, so Dante has this huge poem that culminates in the beatific vision. And for medieval Europe, there was the good, the beatific vision. Uh, That broke down. Um, What is, so then I look at, you know, I I spend a lot of, spent a lot of time in my life in Christian activist circles, let's say. Um, What is the, and they, they talk about a, you know, development. Okay. Well, what is the, so, so I'll I'll sometimes ask Christian activists, what would you like this community to look like if you actually achieve your goal? Do you want it to look like Beverly Hills where there's, you know, or, you know, Brentwood or some, just think of some neighborhood that would be nearly universally known, um, you know, Marin County, um, in the Bay Area, what what exactly does a does the good life look like? The, your answer to that is going to depend deeply upon your assumptions of what the good life is. For example, um, monastics, you know, people who lived on poles, uh, for them, the good life was the beatific vision that could be achieved through radical renunciation of pleasure. But that's, there you go. There's one way. Um, that doesn't look like Brentwood or Beverly Hills or Marin County. This, this stuff is really, really hard. <laughs> and a lot of human history, as Peterson often, the point he makes, which I think is, is well made, most of human history is most people just trying to get through. <laughs> and you see this in little communities in the Dominican Republic. Uh, you see it in, you even see it in suburbs. And just trying to get through might look like, you know, 10 hours a day playing computer games. This is a this is a difficult question about the good and about what life is. And and human beings have been wrestling with this for as long as there have been human beings, I suppose, and have been writing about it for as long as we've had writing. But yet to a certain degree in our culture, we sort of bat that away. And that's part of I mean, that's that's kind of a tangential point. It's just an interesting thing, but you know, in the pre-axial age, most writing was just about grain supplies and you know things like that. There wasn't a lot of writing about the good, but at least since the axial age, we've been we've been trying to figure out this question, and, um, and a lot of those answers are, are 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 have actually continued to give value. Right? We can go back to Socrates, we can go back to Plato, we can go back to Jesus, and say, okay, somehow this this transforms me in ways that that are meaningful to me. And that I feel my life is gooder, is better um, for, for, having, for having adopted these lessons, for having, having you know, conditioned myself to these lessons. So there's, there's kind of three main, three main points that I think we've been hovering around. And then there's another one that I want to get to in kind of interrogating Christianity. But one of them is basically, uh, now I'm struggling to articulate it, but it has to do with is Christianity central to what we would like to preserve about the West, right? And then the second is, um, and how would we know, right? Um, and then the second is, well, I have this sense that a lot of times when people talk about how bad the West is or how bad Christianity is, it's compared to a utopia that has never existed and that they don't even fully describe, right? It's like, okay, so yes, these crossers did some pretty brutal stuff, stuff to each other through Christianity, but like, go read about Papua New Guinea and the, the boys who have to, you know, 
ingest a certain amount of semen before they're allowed to be men. And, you know, the women who have insane menstrual taboos and are beaten by their husbands if they leave a certain area, like humans have been brutal to each other, lots of places. <laughs> um, and lots of different ways. In lots of different ways, right? And so now, so then we could say maybe, and I, I think this is true, that we live in a world that is less brutal, that is much nicer in a lot of ways. In some ways, too nice. In some ways, we're losing things that we need because the environment's become too coddling. But, but overall, I think most of us would choose to live in a world where 30% of our kids aren't like to die of disease and where, you know, uh, 30% of the males that we know aren't likely to end via murder. Um, and 30% of our female friends aren't likely to, to be abducted and raped. Like, so I would say that that's a better world to live in. I'll, I'll take our problems over those problems. Yep, yep. Um, so then the question is, what is Christianity? Is, is, is Christianity part of what allowed this world to arise? And then the next question, for me is, is that something that's unique to Christianity, right? I've said a few times that I think that in wrestling with the, um, with the history of Christianity, we have to wrestle with Hernan Cortez and Francisco Pizarro, but we also have to recognize Bartolome de la Casas. Right? But, but the question that I don't know the answer to is, are there Buddhist and Taoist Bartolome de, de la Casas, right? Or Zoroastrian, right? There's this idea within anthropology that there, that, that at a certain point, is, I think it's Marvin Harris who comes up with this idea, that, that once society scales to a sufficient point, the elites are advantaged by preventing violence in lower classes. Because if, if, you, if I'm the king, and you kill your neighbor, you've actually killed a source of taxes for me. And so it gives rise to these non-killing religions. And so the ethic that, you, that you're not allowed to kill arises independently in lots of different religions in different places. So you have it in Zoroastrianism, you have it in Vedanta, you have it in Judaism, you have it in, um, in Buddhism. Um, it, so is, is what we see in the West the civilizing influence of Christianity, the, the fact that there are that there are missionaries who are screaming bloody murder about what happens to the Cherokee, right? And there are missionaries who are going to the Cherokee and bringing their children to colleges. And that yes, we we do these terrible things in, in colonizing the world, new world, but there are people who are documenting and sending it back and protesting it from the very beginning. Is that how would we how would we honestly approach the claim that that is something specific to Christianity? Because if it is, that's very, very important to know and to try and preserve. So that's that's one of my big that's where I'm stuck, I guess, in this debate uh, about this because, I have a sense that that the secular humanist types, the the new atheist types, they don't really have a scalable solution that scales up, and they haven't addressed this fully. Like they think that if you take away our Christian sort of um, grammar, if we could just all be perfectly rational, like Sam Harris that what would replace it would get rid of all the brutality of Christianity rather than allowing in all the brutality that preceded Christianity and surrounded Christianity. I, I, I'll let you speak. Well, I, I hear that. I just, I just laugh because I just think, well, okay. So how would we, how would we run such an experiment in the real world? One, one thing we might ask is, what are the countries that people wish to leave and what is the countries that people wish to go to? Well, now Latin America is a tough case because, well, Latin America is deeply Christian, mm -hmm. but people want to go from Latin America into the United States. Yeah. Why? Well, money. Okay, yeah, money's a big part of it. Uh, why do people want to, why are, 
very wealthy people in China buying enormous amounts of Vancouver Island or Vancouver, city of Vancouver in Canada. Why are they doing that? Um, so there's there's one thing. There, there's, there certainly is, there remains something in, you know, why are Africans risking their lives to get across the Mediterranean and people leaving Afghanistan and the Near East to try to get into Europe? Why? Why? I'll, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the the counter a counter argument. I don't think okay. it's a great, but because the Europeans have uh, stripped the resources from everywhere else, the Europeans and their descendant civilizations have colonized the best areas, the most disease-free areas, right? Like, there's a reason actually that you might want to live in in California and not in Panama because you're a lot less likely to get malaria in California. And, and then, and then, so not only do they, do they dominate the places that you want to live, the Mediterranean and California and the Pacific coast and uh, the Northeast of North America. Um, but they've also just been stealing the best resources from everywhere else for the last 500 years. So everyone else just wants to come here and get access to those things. If the Dominican Republic looked like South Florida, people would be streaming out of New York to live there. <laughs> If they had the same, I, I, I don't agree with it. I, I, wanna... I understand. I understand. Um, I've I've been to a lot of these places in the world, and it's like, gosh, where I lived in the Dominican Republic was glorious, and the cost to live there was, if you could live there as a Dominican, was nothing compared to California. You know, I <laughs> I I could see the ocean from my bedroom from the Dominican Republic. It was beautiful. Why isn't you know, I'd, I regularly see North Americans try to live in that little town in the Dominican Republic. They would last a few years and then they would go back. And there were a whole host of reasons. So, yeah, no, fa fair enough. It's but, you know, it's it's so that's so one one question is always, OK, how would you what is your test for running this mental experiment? Another interesting thing. And, and to me, when I, I found Tom Holland and I started listening to his stuff. You know, the, the light went on that what we enjoy in the West is the product of basically diluted Christianity, diluted, um, not diluted, like, wait. <laughs> diluted, a little diluted too, um, diluted Christianity. And the, the kinds of questions that haunt someone like Douglas Murray Mm -hmm. It's the framework that Jordan Peterson keeps bringing. To what degree are we simply living off the accumulated capital of sacrificial Christian morality? And when we have burned through that inheritance, what, what really does post-Christianity look like? And that's been some of the anxiety with the post-Christian west in that what happens when you know let's 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 give the wokesters their due um it's on one hand an enormously an attempt to be an enormously generous ideology let's you know for me okay let's pay african americans reparations all right well how high you want to go let's make it really high okay well, America seems to be printing money right now. So let's let's let loose a few trillion dollars if we can somehow, boy, what a I can just imagine how that plays out, tagging who is and who isn't um due reparations. Six percent black, do I get six percent? Yeah, well, there you go. Um and because I see this happening in, you know, say indigenous communities, Indian communities with Oh, casinos yeah. and all of that that's that stuff's all so i think okay let's let's lose a few trillion dollars on african-american communities and then i sit there and i think about what would that really look like and then i ask myself okay let's take the race thing out of it let's say we just lose a few trillion dollars on any non-specific What's that? Kids who are bullied in school. Yeah, kids who are bullied in school. What would happen to that money? 
two generations later, I'm sure some of them would be, you know, it would change the arc for some of them. But, you know, my wife was, my wife was talking, you know, she's like, we should buy a lottery ticket. And I had, we had all, we had most of our kids in the backyard and it's like, would that destroy us? If, you know, suddenly a hundred million dollars descended on our family, I frankly, you know, yeah, a beach house would be nice, you know, getting rid of my, some of my debt, a little more financial security, that would be lovely, but would my marriage survive it? Would my children survive it? The Gates wonder, and they've got billions. So, you know, to me, this, this comes all the way back to, I, I almost always hear in politics, this implicit wish fulfilled, this implicit dream that if only we didn't have our political rivals, then we could fix the world. If only we had unlimited amounts of money, then we could fix the world. And I'm just deeply skeptical of that. But should often, you know, a little less resistance in politics or a little more money, wouldn't that make things potentially a little bit better? Yeah, maybe, maybe sometimes even probably. But I, I think it gets back to these deep questions of what can this world actually afford in terms of human flourishing and goodness? Amazing amount sometimes, but... I'd like to go back a step because like you and I can go on about the political stuff. And, you know, I think that'd be interesting for us, but I feel like there's a, a deeper heart to the conversation that's, that's, that's where it's really at, which is you're talking about what, what happens in post-Christianity. And I was thinking about Ken Wilber and Wilber's argument, right? So, you know, Wilbur has, and I, 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 again, I haven't read this as deeply as I can, so everybody who's listening, take, take what I say with a grain of salt, but he has this idea of developmental levels, right? And that these continue into adulthood, and this is based on the work of adult developmental psychologists like Robert Keegan, um, but, you know, he, he says that the culture that we inhabit is in some sense um, driven by the leading edge of, of adult development at any time in that culture. Now that has changed over history. So we had, we had in a, an indigenous uh, type of situation, we essentially are still within a magical consciousness, which is the type of consciousness that your six and seven year old has, who still really deeply believes in Santa Claus. And that then this gives rise to a mythological type of consciousness where, where the, the, the stories become more archetypal and they're, they're treated differently than, than like Santa Claus is just really, really the same as, you know, uh, as, as something else, right? Like in the animism sort of disappears. And then that gives rise to, to, you know, something else. And eventually we have, you know, nationalism and then we have modernism and, and globalism, right? And one of the ideas here is that as we go through these stages of development, we tend to view the previous stage of the development very negatively. Right? And so modernism is very anti-mythological. And then postmodernism is super anti-modernism. And the idea is that at the integral layer, we start being able to integrate these things. And that came up for me as you're talking because it's like, one of the things he says is the postmodern layer is itself unstable because it's, it doesn't have a grand narrative. And so it has two potentials. It can either transcend up to the integral where it collapses all the way back down to the tribal. And, and so the, the idea of the general divinity of the individual and the fact that we are in some senses all, like for some reason I have this, this, this desire when people start talking about, you know, as a white heterosexual, et cetera, or a, you know, a brown, black indigenous person of color, transsexual, right? When, when they start labeling themselves like this, right? And then they ask me to be an ally, right? 
And when they say ally, it seems to imply to give up all agency in that conversation. I have this desire to say, I'm, I, I am not your ally, <laughs> but I'll happily be your friend. In fact, I will be your brother in Christ, right? <laughs> because, because I, you know, I said, I'm not a Christian in the sense that, that you are, but that seems to me like a stable way to organize people and give people a sense of brotherhood that actually points us to the right ethics to organize big groups that, that this hyper identitarianism combined with this totem pole of who gets to speak through standpoint epistemology, it doesn't, it's not scalable. It doesn't work. It only, it only leads us towards a war, but so, yeah, so I don't want to be an ally, but I do, but, but the flip side of that is that, well, I think that for a lot of young white men, um, they see now the tribalism and the response is to go tribal the other way. And that's QAnon and that's all these things. Yeah. And I, I went down that rabbit hole to a certain degree, right? And then I realized that in the, the game of choosing whose side you are so we can all tear out each other's eyes is the wrong game. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be on the side of not playing that game. Yeah. Um, and something that's rooted in agape and logos <laughs> and that that tells me I've, I've told this story a few times but maybe i don't know if you've heard me tell the story but when when not after george floyd was murdered i saw a lot of people talking about it in a way that felt like it was not helpful and that it was not nuanced and i felt the sense that if i was to offer my opinion it would um it would alienate people. And then even if I was to provide nuance, it wouldn't be heard and so it wouldn't be useful. And that was really a struggle for me to try to say like, well, how do I handle my communication? Because there's something in me that really wants to come out, but I can't, I can't speak to it. And I went and I sat down in the woods and I meditated. And as I was meditating, I had an image pop into my head, I had a vision. And in this vision, I saw fire running through a forest and I could see two versions of the forest, one in which the forest was healthy and one in which the forest had become unhealthy. And in the healthy forest, the fire burns off all the dead wood and then the new growth springs forth. Yep. But in the unhealthy forest, there's too much dead wood, there's too yep. much and it burns everything. It kills the heartwood of the trees and you just have this ash. Yep. And, and so I was asking this question like, we need anger, right? Like the, the, way, the way that I interpreted that vision was that fire represents anger and that anger in an individual, in a relationship, in a community is necessary and that it acts to do this, right? It acts to burn off the deadwood. But when that ecology has become too unhealthy, it just destroys. Yeah. And are we, are we for the fire that transforms or for the fire that just destroys. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was thinking to myself that about this idea that, that Peterson has that we have to be, we don't want to be the friend. We don't want to give people unconditional love because that means that we love the parts of them that are destructive just as much as the parts of them that are productive. Right. Right. Like you can, you can support your friend in a way that, you know, if you, if you buy beer for your friend who's an alcoholic because you love him, are you really loving him? Right. Right. If you buy, if you buy, you know, cocaine or methamphetamine for a friend, right? Are you are you loving them or are you actually contributing to their self destruction? And then, what about yourself? And so I had the sense that like that what you're being asked to be when someone says that you should be an ally is to be the friend who happily gives cocaine to the addict. And that what I want to be for myself is the friend who could stand in the fire and tell me the truth when I don't want to hear it. Yeah. And I want to be that for my friends. And the only reason I feel like that I'm not a white supremacist is because I had friends who did that for me. Hmm. So <laughs> that was quite a personal. Um, no, but it's good. It's good. 
And, you know, I was thinking, so the George Floyd, the trial of the officer that, yeah. that you know, was on his neck is going on. And so is an officer on trial for the death of George Floyd? Or is white America on trial for its treatment of black America? Those are because the evidence in the trial is going to be all about a particular officer and a particular incident. And that's the way we want our system to work to be what the result of the trial is. But your your point is is vitally important in terms of Yeah, if if being an ally means giving up your agency, it's basically another form of colonization. It's reverse colonialism. Rever right. It's saying, okay, I will be your colony. Is, he, is, is that redemptive? Potentially. But probably not what you really want. Um, you know, you play Princess Bride as you wish. Um, as you wish, Princess Buttercup. Um, yeah, it's it's. This is this is the world we live in. This is this is the complexity of of human affairs and human relationships. And you know, so I, I like the way Jonathan Peugeot talks about Christianity in the way that he scales it out because you know when when you were talking about allyship i was thinking about so i've just finished preaching through lent which is in luke jesus march to jerusalem and everyone has an agenda for jesus and jesus just keeps saying no to their agendas and um he, he can, in fact, sometimes tell people quite plainly what is going to happen and they can't hear it. And, and then Jesus, you know, begins this, begins this narrative, begins this, begins this movement in many ways in, in really a very strange way that has culminated in this conversation and what we're talking about. You know, in, in some ways, it's the most astounding feat of human colonization we've ever known, but he doesn't do it. Um, I mean, he, 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 here's a man that is portrayed to have the kind of power who can raise the dead or is still a storm with a word. And he doesn't use any of that power against his religious, political, or social adversaries. In fact, what he does is he allows himself to be sacrificed, he but in a particular... What's that? The anti Ozymandias. Yeah. You know, if he gets into the garden and Peter brandishes a sword and Jesus heals the, the slave of the chief priest, heals his ear. And in doing so, Jesus basically says to the entire crowd, if any blood is going to be shed here, let it be mine. Yeah. And, but now Jesus is, I mean, the way that the story weaves through these questions is jesus a victim sort of is jesus in control yeah he still is and and the text just keeps working through those issues again and again he is the is he their ally but he's not doing what they say he's not doing what the disciples say he's certainly he's resisting the both the roman and the religious leaders but he's he's weaving his way through this and the and then even with you know whether or not you buy the physicality of the resurrection the story let's say it's it's all a made up story even in the story he doesn't knock on pontius pilate's door or herod's door he doesn't ask for a new meeting of the sanhedrin and say you stick your fingers in my hands he doesn't do any of that and that is what all of our superheroes would do. Jesus seems to, and, and, and with this story told by people who really believed it, 
that sets in motion everything that we're talking about. And in some ways we stand before this story and we see the events in Minnesota or, you know, the events in China now. Um, we, we see the world and we, we look at these stories and for now thousands of years, Christians have looked at the story of their life and looked at Jesus' story and says, how does, how must I respond to these stories of Jesus in my story here and now? And so, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking about for an upcoming video is, so again, the question, what's on trial in Minnesota now? White America's treatment of black America or a particular officer's treatment of a particular individual? We play these, we play these roles as human beings, you know, archetype, arche, arche is first or foremost or top in Greek and typos is, you know, you've got type and anti-type. And so an archetype is a, it's, it's a role that someone is playing, but it's a, we, you know, back to Jordan Peterson's first biblical series, we see things and then we represent things in our own body. If you have a son, you'll notice your child, your son trying on your shoes. If you're a man, if you're, you know, we, we, our kids are doing all of this all the time and we keep doing it with each other. And then we have this image, this story, this, this man that's at the center of not just Western history, because Christianity has gotten into a lot of places, but this man who stands at the center of it with this story, and it's the, it's the strangest of stories if compared to Julius Caesar's heroism of conquering the Gauls or Alexander the Great's conquest of the whole world. And that this story becomes the story that begins to define a civilization and that strange civilization from that story does what the Chinese from their stories didn't seem to care to do, which was conquer and attempt to unify everything. And here we are still talking about that story. That's, a, that's an astounding thing. Yeah. So to come back to these simple questions, right? Um, we live in the West, right? Is the West that we live in a product of Christianity or the Enlightenment? Right. So that's one question. <laughs> Another question would be: Is that a good thing either way? <laughs> yeah. right? we, we discovered that question along the way. And then the next question would be: If there's something unique about the West, is it actually recoverable specifically from Christianity? And I, I don't think that we've answered these questions because they're incredibly difficult questions to answer, but I hope that they have been insightful for people. And I don't think that uh, we can get deeper right now. <laughs> um, but there's one more that I have in this series that's something that I've struggled with and I wanted to um, yeah, put to you, which is uh, the role of, of the divine feminine, right? And you know, in Peterson's Maps of Meaning, he talks about this idea that there is, there is, uh, there is father culture and mother nature and the divine individual. And each of these has a, um, a, a beneficent and a vindictive or a tyrannical aspect, right? Mother nature is, is the spring, right? And it's the harvest and it's also the flood. And the king is, is the thing that, that, um, that gives us culture, right? That gives us fire, that gives us all these things. And it's also the thing that prevents us from freedom, right? And the individual is the hero and the individual is the adversary that aims itself against B. So he makes this claim and then he makes the claim that Christianity is the most archetypally complete religion. And yet it seems that the divine feminine is not fully represented in Christianity to me, right? Because 
we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, you know, I was looking at this this morning. I believe that, you know, some, some scholars of, of Semitic religion believe that, that Yahweh used to have a concert, a consort named Ashira, and yet she's not there anymore. And Tiamat, who is the, the, the mother goddess of the Mesopotamians, her name is retained in the Bible as, as, as you know, it's the root of the word for flood in the Hebrew, I believe. And yet um, the flood is not personified as an individual. It's only there as a natural element. And I'm I terribly have this secular sense. of the Bible. <laughs> yeah. And, and I have this sense. Or I, when, when, I, when I contrast those two aspects of Peterson's message, I have this, this question that comes up. There's two aspects to it. Looking at both the beneficent and, and or the beneficial and the negative. So one aspect is up until maybe 150 years ago, Mother Nature was always more powerful than Father Culture. We were always scraping our our ourself by against the exigencies of nature. Right? But for the first time in human history, we have the technological power to destroy the capacity of the earth to, to be benevolent. So how can a religion that doesn't, that doesn't describe the divine feminine answer our needs in being able to, to articulate and have a story that guides us in relationship to it? So that's the beneficent side. And the negative side is this. For most of agrarian history, women were limited in their social power because of the nature of men having to do plowing and men being predominant in war. But we exist in a situation now where women have far more power, really, than they've had. They have far more opportunity to climb the top of the hierarchies that determine where the nuclear bombs go and if they go. But it seems to me that if you don't have a model for how the feminine becomes weaponized and destructive and the flood, then you don't, then you're not equipped to answer the questions that we're facing. So how does a religion that doesn't have that deal with this? I, I actually love, I had a conversation with Chloe Valerie, but I love the movie Moana because I feel like it's, it's the, it's the hero's journey that, that, um, that Peterson described with a lot of these memes focused on the divine feminine, right? Uh, the feminine hero. And she, she sees the, the destructive aspect of mother nature and take something from the cultural aspect that's been stolen and gives it back to her and returns her to the, the beneficent aspect of herself, right? So that's, that's my line of reasoning. And, and that's a hesitation for me about saying, okay, I'm gonna commit myself to, to Christianity. It's like, well, where, and, and we have Mary, Right, and Mary has become; she's risen to the level of divinity in the in the the consciousness of many people, and that's a that's that's something that I think there's quite a lot of controversy with in Christian circles. So I'm I'm curious to have you speak to that. I'm I'm quite persuaded by Jonathan Peugeot's. by Peugeot pointing out that a lot of what we've done in our culture in the so-called empowerment of women is basically invited them into the masculine. Yeah. And in, in movie representations essentially the feminine has been banished and the masculine is all that is left and women are cast in form in in women are cast in masculine roles i just cup last couple of days have been doing some reading about elizabeth the 1st in england and 
people who love to talk about glass ceilings. I don't know if they know anything about Elizabeth I's reign and what she actually did and how she used femininity to, in many ways, change the path of England from a role player in Europe, setting her up to, in many ways, rule the world. Uh, Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, how she managed religion, how she managed her sexuality in order to, it's, it's, it's an astoundingly remarkable story that with all of the attention being paid to powerful women, I seldom hear people talk about Elizabeth I. It's, 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 a, it's an unbelievable story. Protestantism, I think, struggles in some ways with this because of its reaction for certain theological things to some of what had been tradition in the Orthodox and Roman Catholic world surrounding Mary and the feminine, because there was representation of the feminine in Mary that Protestants tended to dismiss. So I'll, I'll do my best to answer the question still as a Protestant, because I think there are a lot of Orthodox and Roman Catholics who can um, talk more about the feminine than I can, because they have a few resources that I don't have, at least from their tradition. I think in a Protestant way, we are the feminine. The church is the feminine. Humanity is the feminine. And I think that comes through in a whole lot of ways in the Hebrew scriptures and in the prophets. Uh, Israel is, is the bride, is the daughter, is the unfaithful wife of the Lord. That's part of the reason I think um, the Lord has no the Lord has no bride because his bride is Israel. And some of the prophets lay that out fairly directly. But she's an unfaithful bride. But that is the cast, that is the role that she has casted. Now it's very fluid because Israel is also his son. And so you know Jesus comes in. So Others have noted that in, in some of Jesus' most, um, for example, the parable of the prodigal son, the, the father doesn't have a wife, but the father in some cases acts like a mother. And so mother and father are integrated into the one father character in Luke 15 and the story of the prodigal son, because the father does some very unfatherly things. And that's often caused a lot of speculation. But I think finally, the world and the church are the feminine in Christianity. And when Peugeot was trying to explain the Virgin Mary to Jordan Peterson, I found a lot of what Jonathan said there quite compelling in that our femininity is our responsiveness to the, the, the will of God in how we serve God in the world. And so there's, in some ways, even in the crucifixion of Christ, something deeply feminine about Christ crucified if we're if we have a certain understanding of masculinity and femininity and this gets played all the way out to the book of revelation where and this is something that even protestants can embrace where the church is the bride of christ the apostle paul riffs on this in ephesians 5 um and i know this is this is quite controversial within certain argument circles revolving around things like women's ordination in the Protestant church. But I think in many ways, the church is the divine feminine because that is the role the church must play. But analogous to Israel in some ways, 
the church is also the rebellious, um, adulterous wife because the church keeps trying to sleep with the other gods. And the church finds again and again that the other gods mistreat her. And what she must do is return to her one true husband. And again, the, the, the characters in the story are so fluid. They, and that, that's very common in Christianity because Christ in some ways is an image of the divine feminine in one aspect and in another way and paul sort of plays through this in ephesians 5 christ is also the husband who gives himself up for the wife and gives himself up completely for the wife and that's sort of this dance of masculine and feminine in christianity that you know it's 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 the husband bears the weight in order to exalt the wife. You know, the beatific vision in Dante is the beatific vision of a woman. It's Beatrice that they are, you know, that they are fixated upon. You see this in chivalric traditions. You know, you can read about this in Don Quixote. Um, it's all of this back and forth and back and forth. And masculine and feminine is not destroyed it is somehow fulfilled and the fulfilling of it becomes this 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 dance this divine dance c.s lewis writes about that now in christian tradition this divine dance isn't usually sexualized as such but it's this it's this constant giving and serving for the welfare of the other and you see that in peugeot's ideas about you know, the job of the leader is to give, you know, to sacrifice on behalf of those below. And the job of those below are to give and sacrifice on behalf of those above. And in this, you know, in each filling, fulfilling their roles, what you have is shalom. And you see this between, so sometimes we see this between father and son. Jesus talks about that in the gospel of John. Um, C.S. Lewis has, a very, has some very interesting things to say about equality and the specific pleasure of the inferior. You know, I was, in, I was in an airport and I was watching some uh, law enforcement individuals train their dogs in an airport. And the specific, the specific joy and glory of those dog was to play the game sniffing for you know, drugs or bombs or what have you. But, but the, 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 dog, the dog was simply glorified in its pleasure of serving its master. And that I would say is in the Christian, in the Christian dance, that is the joy of the feminine church. That is fulfilled. Yes, fulfilled in serving its master. That's the that's the specific pleasure of the son in serving his father. But I just and, have to say, as that? somebody raised in the counterculture and you know came up through anthropology, like I wince with that comparison because it's like what I hear is you're comparing the role of a woman in a relationship to a man to a dog in a relationship to a trainer. And uh, I imagine that for a lot of women listening to this, that's going to be, uh, or, and men, right? Yes. That's going to sound very, very uh, off-putting. Yes. But it's not about men and women as such necessarily, because men are often in the, the feminine role too. It's there in the inferior and superior. And, and this is the struggle. I mean, this is the, this is the crazy thing about Jesus, because in some ways, Nobody did more than Jesus to promote the most radical egalitarianism you can imagine. I mean, he says to his disciples, you have one master and you're all brothers. You know, look at the Gentiles. They're all, you know, they're all sharp elbows trying to climb up the pyramid. Not among you. That's what he says to his disciples. You're all the same. And then he says these kinds of things. And they're like, well, how does this and this really work? And Jesus says wow. to his disciples, 
you know, you, you want to be the greatest here. And then they're sitting in a room and there's a servant kid in the corner. He's probably the son of the owner that of the rented room. He says, kid, come here. You know, you want to be the greatest, be like that kid. You know, wash, you know, he, they all gather for the meal. He strips down and starts washing their feet and they're horrified, you know, and Peter's, you know, Peter always speaks for the group. No, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you can have no part of me. Oh, then wash everything. Now, Peter, feet are enough. (laughs) Get the point. And so Jesus is on one hand, the most revolutionary egalitarian the world has seen. And that egalitarian strain that the West has comes from Jesus. But this other arch, this other hierarchy is also in Jesus. And in a sense, what Jesus says is you can't have equality without hierarchy and you can't have hierarchy without equality. And the roles that we play in this continue to be enormously fluid and you might be the emperor of rome who rules over all the earth but you're also the servant of all and and christianity is constantly playing with these things so i like this this line of logic and it's going to be interesting to 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 go deeper into it but i want to go back for a second because i think you've described very nicely some of the ways in which the divine feminine is captured within christianity and how uh, this is, there's a lot of wisdom in, in some of it. I'm, I'm actually thinking about, I've always thought of myself as a very masculine individual. And I think that's, that's um, it's morphologically true and it's psychologically true. Like when I take Jordan Peterson's big five understand yourself thing, I pretty much occupy the most masculine pole on, on most of the distributions that are different between men and men. Um, so I'm higher in empathy than politeness. I'm super low in both. <laughs> so, so, so in any event, I, you know, I've always, you know, I used to joke in my 20s that I don't, I don't have a feminine side. I have a wife, or you know, like that's 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 good enough. <laughs> um, but then as a teacher, I had this interesting thing, which was that I had a chance, you know, to really specialize in working with men, but I chose to work with men and women. And I discovered that in meeting the emotional needs, particularly of female students, I grew as a teacher. And I felt that the insights that I got, even though they were more expensive for me, it was harder for me to teach mixed groups, it was harder for me to teach women. Um, I liked who I was better after that. I liked what I had learned. And um, so, you know, fast forward a few years and I've been doing this for a while and I started bringing in all the archetypal storytelling that I had learned from Peterson and people were really responding to it. So I told the, this dragon story and I told the dragon story is like, this is fundamentally what we are out about in parkour and in practice, we are out there confronting our dragons. And then I, I told one version of that story and then I pointed out that the story generally has a male hero and I introduced the, the um, Beauty and the Beast story as, as the female version of it. And so this is what, what Peterson had sort of put as the top of the, the female version of that story. And I got a huge pushback from the women who were there. They didn't respond to it. They didn't like that story. It didn't, they didn't, it didn't resonate with them. And part of that was probably the way that I told it because I think I centered the male character in it much more than the female character. Um, but it didn't work in any of them. And uh, it was quite a little crisis of consciousness for me. And so I stayed up very, very late thinking about it. And um, and I thought about the story of St. George and the Dragon. And I thought about this, the fact that the princess is, um, she's unwilling to let George try to save her, right? She doesn't want anyone to die in her stead. So she's a hero. And then, and then George stabs the, 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 the dragon with his lands. But the dragon isn't defeated until the, the princess throws her girdle at the dragon. And it's these two, these two, they represent these two aspects of it. So I told that story. And what was interesting about that is that I had this idea that there's that there's two ways to confront chaos. One is that you 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 kill it, you drive your lance into it, you destroy it, you know, you assert 
a dominance over it. But the other is that you contain it and you give it space to come into order. And you need both because a child is chaos. A two-year-old is about the most chaotic thing that you'll ever experience. And your job is not to smash it down. Your job is to hold it and love it and give it space to become what it can. And, and so I had this idea of the, the masculine heroic as the, as the thing that, that, um, that asserts and the feminine heroic as the thing that surrounds and surrenders into. Yes. But here's a really strange thing about that epiphany for me. In the, the expression of my own pursuit of the heroic, I climb up into a tree and I jump between two tree branches, 20 feet off the ground. But climbing to the branch and deciding to do it feels very assertive. But I have to wait until a tunnel opens. And it feels like this. It feels like there's a moment where I don't jump, it jumps. Right? Where the jump has happened and I am simply surrendering into the moment, allowing it to happen. And that moment is surrender. And it's profoundly feminine. And so I had this discovery in myself that I needed this feminine power, which is represented in Christ, right? Because Christ willingly sacrifices himself, right? Yep. His final act is, well, not his final act because he comes back from the dead, but his final act before he dies is to accept death. Yes, yes. To surrender to death. Right. Father, into your hands, I, I commend, commend my, sp my spirit. It's a, it's a feminine move. Yeah. And what was so strange for me was to discover that at the heart of my practice, which is a very like seemingly a hyper masculine practice, it is much more men who pursue parkour than women. It is much more men who pursue jumps at height and doing scary things. I was coming, I was, I was seeking a feminine strength. I was seeking a chance to commune with this capacity for acceptance and surrender. Um, So, so there's something really powerful there, that, but I don't know that it answered the two questions that I have about the role of Christianity in solving the problems that we currently have, because there's two that I focused on. One is, does the story within Christianity orient us effectively towards a world in which we have the capacity to destroy the natural world? And thinking of ourselves as the feminine doesn't put us in a relationship to the natural world in a way that informs how we behave towards it, that understands the sacredness of this feminine. Or I haven't seen that articulated in what don't, you said. Don't you think that the ways that we have approached the natural world that have been most destructive have been masculine? Yes, yes. But does it teach us to respect the, the, the power of the mother nature when we think of ourselves as the feminine relationship to father culture. You should, you should look into Sabbath, year of Jubilee, some of those themes in the Old Testament. Um, so there's, of course, Sabbath gets played out with manna. They go out and God says, okay, I'm going to give you manna, only connect enough for a day. So of course, some enterprising person is like, connect for two days right now. There's enough of it on the ground. So they so collect for two days and then the next day they get up and everybody's going out to get there. So, oh, I don't have to. And they open their jar and it's all wormy. Oh crap, I gotta go out and get manna. So then the sixth day rolls around and the Lord says, okay, go out and collect two days today because there's not gonna be any tomorrow. And the guy who collect two days before says, ah, fool me once, shame on you. And then goes out and he collects one day. And then the next day, everybody opens their pot and they eat for two days. He doesn't have enough for two days because he didn't listen. And so there's this rhythm that develops in creation. You find it right in Genesis 1. You find it in manna. You find it, and, and this is this relationship C.S. Lewis likes to call nature our sister. Not our mother, but our sister. Lewis can go both ways because it's quite flexible with this stuff. But nature is our sister. And, and what we want to do is be able to engage in a productive relationship with our sister. So we're feminine when it comes to God, but we're masculine when it comes to our sister, but we have to learn to be a productive masculine in order to allow the feminine of nature to actually yield her bounty 
freely to us rather than a raping masculine that seeks to dominate and extricate from the feminine that which it desires at her expense. And I would argue that in terms of nature, we have been the raping masculine. And you see this in Tolkien with the elves. For the elves, rope is more ropey. Uh, clothes conceal and protect better. Um, the elves seem to have that that husbanding relationship with nature, husbandry, that nature gives of her bounty freely in a way that is, you know, giving for nature. You know, we've arrived at 8 billion people because we figured out how to, how to harvest nitrogen from the air and insert it into the ground and force nature to, you know, basically boost productivity which has destroyed the nitrogen cycle. I mean, this is, and, and I would argue that if you look at the year of Jubilee, leaving fields fallow, a lot of this stuff in the Old Testament, it has a lot to do with, basically the Lord also says to Israel, when you go into the land, keep my covenant. If you don't keep my covenant, the land will vomit you out. In other words, the woman is going to kick you out of the marriage. So there's actually quite a bit in the Old Testament about this stuff. Okay, I like that. Um, I uh, I think that was very very powerful and informative. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do one more question and then we'll we'll have to wrap. There's a lot more a lot more for us to discuss. We haven't got it deep into phenomenology yet, but um, but I just wanted to finish this line of questioning. So the other aspect of this is that. I think part of the what it feels like to me like the sublimation of the, the divine feminine within Christianity, it also it also produces a a psychology of women that um, that gives insufficient respect for their shadow, and that that is played out in in feminism and in, 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 in our in our culture, right? Right now we have a crisis of depression, anxiety, and suicide that is impacting young women in particular massively more than any other group. And like girls who are 11 years old who have a history of like zero suicide rate or have seen a massive increase in their suicide rate. And part of what this is, is, is the rise of social media. And I don't think that's all of what it is, but what's in, what I think people don't understand is that it's essentially social media is a force amplification tool for what are what are prototypically female forms of aggression. Right? Now men can engage in aggression this way and certainly women can hit and attack and all that stuff is certain, you know. But historically and cross-culturally, women use social isolation, ostracization, gossip as ways to damage each other more than men do and so men hit each other more than women do and when it comes to hitting each other we've had a, a scaling up of force from fists to clubs to pointy rocks on sticks to projectile weapons to guns to nuclear weapons right it's it's we we have some kind of cultural technologies at least around understanding this but we've basically gone from a world in which you can gossip about people to everyone in your high school, to a world in which you can gossip to everybody in the world. <laughs> I mean, not everybody, but you can you can expand that circle massively. And I think that that our inability to articulate and recognize that women have the capacity to aggress and they have specific ways to engage in aggression, and that there's a shadow in women as well as a shadow in men, actually limits our ability to, to address problems. And I, and I think that this plays to a, a Petersonian point as well, which is that I don't respect you unless I recognize the monster in you. And so there's, the, there's this desire to, to treat women as these pristine princesses and then say they can do everything that men can do better than men. But I don't think that you can play both of those, right? If you, if you are a full agent, and I believe every, of course, that women absolutely are, that means that the line between good and evil runs down their hearts too. But men and women are different. And the way that that evil expresses 
um, and that good expresses are different. And when we don't have the capacity to articulate and understand how that is developing, I think it, it's a real limiting, it's a crutch. So I'm curious to hear your, your take on, on how a system that approaches understanding the divine feminine in the way that Christianity does can actually gird us to deal with a problem like this. Because it seems to me that this post-Christian society that's living within Christianity but has postmodernism and critical theory and everything is not getting it. That's a good question. That's a good question. And I, I find your um your your articulating your articulation of it compelling and you know working off the work of Jonathan Haidt and others that have, have highlighted a lot of this. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I I have done much thinking in terms of a Christian response to um, to that in particular. The the thing that comes to my mind is um, the Heidelberg Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism is a is a document which which it's a fairly typical Western catechism, and it comes to um, it comes to the Ten Commandments, um, puts a very high bar on murder. Um, what is God's will in the Sixth Commandment? I am not to belittle, hate, insult, or kill my neighbor. Now the belittle and insult are sort of the the feminine ways of killing your neighbor and the you know strangling shooting punching are the masculine not by my thoughts my words my looks or gesture and certainly not by actual deeds and i am not to be party of this uh, party to this in others rather i am to put away all desire for revenge i am you know and again this 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 putting away the desire for revenge is potentially, I think, a deeply feminine move. Um, and it, it comes in response to a repeated injunction in the Old Testament. Um, you know, I will, I will avenge, you know, I am the Lord and not you. It keeps blood from you. I am not to harm or recklessly endanger myself either. Prevention of murder is why the government is armed with the sword. Um, and, and so I think you're right. I think there are probably people who can far better than I go into a subject like this. Um, I, th I think you're right. I think, I think social media has essentially weaponized certain feminine forms of combat and scaled it up in in ways that perhaps are analogous to what we've been doing with violent weapons over the course of the last few hundred years and what we've also done is sort of put these hands into put these weapons in the hands of school children yeah and yeah. that's what we see happening yes yeah i mean yeah, we need we need stories that help us know that we can't give uh, cell phone, uh, smartphones to our children. <laughs> yeah, um, I I struggle with this because there's something within the Christian story that, for me, seems like it it articulates the highest good better than anything else. Logos and agape. Um, and yet there are things that I really feel like, I think there's reasons why people are struggling to maintain it. And, and there, are, there are other systems, there are other things that, that, that provide insight, right? Like I think Tiamat and the Morrigan and you know, um, Hela, like these figures from mythology, they're, they're powerful for us to understand as well. Like, I think there's a reason why, you know, the original, the first dragon story, the first dragon story that we have in recorded history is the story of the mother goddess, the goddess of creation, transforming herself into a destructive dragon and bringing a flood and a, 
series of monsters that then have to be defeated by the first culture hero, Marduk, right? And that's a story that to me compels a respect for the power of, of the feminine that I don't think that we have right now. And that's that's a negatively valent story, and we need a, a positive valent story, and that's why I like I like Moana, right? You have Tafiti and Taka, but uh, but I see something there, and and so that's 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 just a you know as I'm playing with all these things, I want to, to address that. So um, I, I like last time. I feel like man, there's a lot more on the table here because I think that uh, that a deep dive into phenomenology versus the scientific epistemology is something that that I need to facilitate. I need to figure it out myself. You know, I think you're you're playing with that grounds. Obviously, Jonathan's probably leading uh, the phenomenology side of the dance in some ways. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm, I, I hope to get him on this podcast as well at some point. But uh, I know you and I will be talking to John John Berveke here soon, so we'll see That'll see be what fun. happens. In conversation as well so we'll uh we'll, we'll we'll pick up where we need to after that and see where we're at that sounds good i you know i think you know you're talking about part of the part of what happened in the protestant reformation so for me again assessing the protestant reformation is an ongoing project because protestantism is a protest against certain things a protest against the Roman Catholic Church specifically, but there are elements that go broader. And, um, you know, it's my hope that at some point the protest ends because protests should end. Um, and it's been a long conversation already. But again, I think, I think individuals like Tolkien and Lewis were very helpful because the some of what the some of what the Protestant reformers wanted to do was was engage in in some so so it seems again reading Lewis that medieval society fairly well you know was was successful to some degree of integrating the classical the pagan classical into Christianity as Christianity moved through pagan areas of Europe. Christianity, you know, if if you had to look at a superpower for this world religion, the one thing Christianity has managed to do better than Islam, Buddhism, any of the other competitors, is it manages to cross, jump over cultural barriers. The center of gravity of Christianity has continued to move around the world and that's happening today. You know, Africa and Asia are undergoing massive revivals of, you know, basically transformations by Christianity. 100 to 200 years from now, it'll be very interesting to see what happens as Christianity continues to penetrate China, uh, what happens to North Korea, given the radical evangelization of South Korea, um, what happens to Christianity in Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and so Christianity has showed an amazing capacity to, um, to, to penetrate and colonize, but then also be colonized by other cultures. And that has happened repeatedly throughout human history in a way that Islam really doesn't do. Um, you know, Hinduism pretty much sort of stays in India. Buddhism, you know, its main centers are certain place. The West kind of plays with it. So it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens as, as how these new, these new masses, and there'll be massive numbers because the, I mean, the projections, the population projections of Africa are just enormous. And these massive Christian populations begin to influence the story that for the last you know, for the last thousand years has tended to be Europe and, and the Americas. So it's, it's a, it's a very big story. It's a very long play. 
And um, it'll be very interesting to see, for example, what an authentic Chinese Christianity looks like, such as, you know, we're beginning to see increasingly what authentic African, Sub-Saharan African Christianity looks like. And those will take decades and centuries to develop as well. So that's that's sort of been Christianity's superpower in human history. And it'll be it'll be fascinating to watch. You know, we'll only see just little bits of it, but fascinating yeah. to know what happens as as not only Christianity changes these populations and these cultures and impacts their own pagan mythologies and appropriates them. Um, because that that goes on. And I think you know, to get back to, you know, where you were going with some of the integral stuff. I think what we will, what we're continuing to see in the West now is again, sort of a recycling of going back to the pagan, back to the tribal. And it seems Christianity picks it up from there again. Lewis and Chesterton saw that and said, oh, we're getting pagan again. Good. That means we're going to get back into the cycle. And Dude, we'll see. Because um, I was raised, I was raised in, uh, I was raised a pagan, right? Basically, yeah. Christian were you? Um, and now, I'm reading Tolkien right now, so I'm. Uh, I think this is my fourth, fourteenth time through Tolkien. So I just finished the Two Towers, and one of the things I've been, I've been really trying to pay attention for where is the Christian myth here, and uh, you know, so one of the things that they talk about is that there, that there's no religion in Tolkien. Um, and I don't think that's as true as you might think, because the elves are really religious figures. They're monks, basically. Yeah. <laughs> They're nature monks. You know, Faramir and his men at the, you know, they, they, before a meal, they bow to the West, to Numenor, right? Yeah. Um, Anyways, you know, and then there's the whole master servant relationship, which is so strange for modern people in Sam and Frodo, right? Like, yeah. you're so tempted to read that as like a, a strangely dom sub sexual relationship, right? Um, because we just don't, we don't, we don't have those ideas anymore that that, that was based off of. Um, in any event, yeah, I, I, uh, we could just go on you and i can, can shoot the shit for hours um but i do i do want to get i have some uh, to respect your time and the audience's time is two and a half hours of chatting so it's a big we'll, we'll, it's a big time <laughs> we'll, we'll give them a break and come back um, all right let's let's close it there that was a wonderful conversation thank you thank you paul thank you rafe it's good to see you again